I have to say, I feel like a rock star. This is amazing. Wow, so many wonderful humans out there. Not so uh, skeptical now, are we, about psychology? Love life and enjoy every moment. Uh, thank you. Yes, vegetables. I uh, spend a lot of time with veggies these days. Uh, a lot of you would, um, uh, if you're old enough, remember me from my uh, many years uh, anchoring late news for both the ABC and SBS, almost 30 years spent broadcasting and in news journalism. And if, like me, uh, seeing all that bad news night after night uh, just filled your heart with a lot of sadness and, and, and darkness, how do we change? Well, can you imagine what it did to me, uh, having to bring you that news every night? And it got me thinking, uh, here's a slide of um, one of the positive things that came out of that role, a series on homelessness that I do for SBS. We've got the second part coming up this August, so look out for that in um, mid-August. Uh, is I realised that I wanted to look at what was driving the conflicts that we see around the world and that there must be a better way for journalists and news media to tell us the stories but also provide us with some of the possible solutions uh, to some of the bad things that were going on. So I took some long service leave from SBS and um, I started working in the area of climate change because I could see that as becoming a really important driver to the causes of a lot of go global conflict and poverty. And 15 years later, um, it's um, everywhere, um, probably except um, in some of the key leadership areas where it should be mentioned more often. But we all know that it's there and it's happening and it's really changing our planet. So I spent some time with Al Gore and then traveled the world um, sharing the importance of addressing climate change. And then I came back to my apartment in Potts Point uh, on the 13th floor um, and I have this very bland balcony and I realised that I was intellectually and theoretically talking about the issues of climate change but in my actual life I was doing little to address it. I didn't know where my food had come from, I was flying, uh, taking planes everywhere around the world and I realised I was contributing to it in, in a way. So I looked at that little balcony in that boring space and I had spent a lot of time in farms and in nature during my travels and I realised, uh, did I need to change uh, my perspective on my footprints on the planet? And could that little balcony on the 13th floor, 20 square metres, be part of um, the solution? Uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, my biophilia had turned into biophobia. I rarely spent time in nature. I was terrified of bees and spiders and anything that might sting or bite me. And so I said to my husband that I was going to try to change that balcony into a little piece of nature in the heart of the concrete and steel of, of Potts Point, one of the densest piece, pieces of urban uh, infrastructure in the world, actually. There's about 12,000 people per square kilometre in Potts Point. Uh, he thought I was mad, but like a lot of my ideas, he just sort of went along with it and thought, OK, she'll probably tire of this in a few months' time. Uh, so in that year, I decided to plant some veggies to see if I could grow my own. I live above a, a, a supermarket in Potts Point, so I can get all my veggies downstairs, but I thought, could I actually grow them myself? I had been around enough people that were growers and producers to know the basic, um, you need sunlight, a bit of water and some soil in pots, but could I reproduce that? Now, 100 years ago, everyone in this room would have grown and cooked their own food. So it's quite extraordinary that in 100 years, most of us have lost that skill set. So I was convinced I could try to bring that back. So in that first year, I brought up some pots and some potting mix and planted some seeds. And I have to admit, I was more shocked than anyone else that things actually grew. Uh, I killed a few things and a few things died and I put the wrong things in the wrong places. But after talking to Peter Cundall at Gardening Australia and a few other um, experts, um, they gave me a few tips. And in that first year, I grew 70 kilos of produce on that balcony. Um, 43, yeah, I know, pretty amazing, eh? 43 different herbs and vegetables, and everything I grew was organic. I didn't use pesticides and, and um, harmful insecticides. Again, I understood how bad they were in dam damaging our environment, but, um, and everything just thrived, and it changed and transformed my world in a way that I wasn't expecting. I thought intellectually I would prove a point. Yes, I could grow food and vegetables and, and cook them, but I didn't, wasn't expecting how it would change me. So I set aside 10 minutes a day, because you know everyone's time poor, 10 minutes a day only to do my gardening, and then I started to realize 
I wanted to spend more time. I started to make excuses to my friends that, oh, no, I've got another appointment, but really I just wanted to hang out with my veggies on the balcony. And um, I was just there all the time. You couldn't take me away. And, and I didn't even understand myself how this transformation was happening or why it was happening. Obviously, one of the, uh, the big dopamine um, um, pluses was getting all these delicious produce um, from my balcony. These tomatoes and capsicum, that was just one day um, on the balcony, um, eight or nine different herbs and vegetables. Uh, again, coming out of a few pots on a 20 square metre balcony, pretty extraordinary. Uh, lemons, who would think lemons could grow in a pot in a balcony, but I get beautiful dwarf Meyer lemons. Um, my carrots, this is my farm and I do shot. I actually pull carrots out of the dirt on a 13th floor balcony. And again, they tasted better and more sweeter than anything that um, I'd ever um, bought at even a farmer's market before. And it changed the way my family and I cooked. We, um, um, you know, uh, ate and, and cooked what we saw growing. So rather than just going to a recipe book or going to a supermarket, I would look at what was fresh on the balcony and that would be the dish that I cooked. So I was eating and growing within season, which meant that my vegetables had more nutrients in it, they were more abundant, and of course, everything was free. So I was saving a lot of money as well on what I was buying from the supermarket. I became conscious of what I was wasting because I spent so much time growing my own food, I didn't want to waste anything. I got a worm farm and brought worms onto the balcony, which was also hilarious too. My husband would introduce me at, at parties and events saying, have you met my wife? She has worms. Uh, he, he thinks that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> But my worms um, are wonderful. Uh, again, worms have created all the soil on the planet, so they're just so much more important than we are. And all my green waste goes into the worm farm. My worms munch them up and make this nutritious fertilizer and worm wee that I feed back into my plants and it makes them really healthy. Worm wee and worm poo is like pseudo ephedrine from plants. I'm telling you, they go crazy. And it just made everything that I grew even more delicious and, and, and more tasty. This is what I was really not expecting. Creating this green patch on my balcony, un, you know, unknowingly, I created a green corridor for so much of the bird life um, and insect life in Potts Point. Again, there's not a lot of greenery, so there's not a lot of places they can hang out. And suddenly, literally overnight, I had birds fighting to hang out on my balcony. These are the lorikeets that come um, every morning, and they're hilarious. And even though they might pick at some of my fruit and some of my flowers uh, that are going to turn into beautiful vegetables. I just love seeing them enjoy that space. So I get cockatoos and magpies and currawongs, um, and they just have a ball. And the other insect that I think I was telling you before, some of my biophobia was a fear of bees. I'm allergic to bees and bee stings, and I'd never seen a bee on my balcony, and I thought that was a good thing. But when you're growing um, vegetables, you need pollinators and bees to convert your flowers into vegetables. So I planted some zucchini one, one um, uh, late spring and they weren't turning into zucchini um, fruit. And when I did some research, they asked me, you know, do you have pollinators? No, I don't, I'd never seen any. So you have to plant some plants to attract them to pollinate your zucchini. So until then I was doing it with a paintbrush, you know, so I'd get a paintbrush and move the pollen from the female flowers to the male flowers and it was taking way too long. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna plant some borage, which bees apparently love because they're sweet. Um, they have these beautiful five pointed purple flowers and uh, bees just go gaga when they see them. And so I planted them to attract bees, but I didn't think a bee would ever know that they were borage growing on a 13th floor in Potts Point apartment balcony. Anyway, so I planted these borage flowers and the morning that the flowers opened up, I very skeptically was there with my camera, you know, looking at these um, um, flowers, not expecting anything to happen. And suddenly I saw this sh dark shadow hovering around the flowers and um, I went in, closely and I couldn't believe it. It was the first bee I'd ever seen on my balcony hovering on the, the borage flower. And this photo is actually off that very first bee. And it's the female bees that collect the honey. And every morning at sunrise and sunset, she would come back to the balcony. And she not only collected the borage, but she pollinated all my zucchini and all my other um, fruit as well. And then she brought her girlfriends as well. And they would all party, you know, on my balcony, getting drunk on my nectar from my borage. And I would just get so caught up and fascinated by seeing the pollen and the way it stuck to their back legs and how they'd hover from flower to flower. I completely forgot that I was allergic to these bees and I just was filled with the wonder of the bee. And um, 
and the important role they play in our, in our food systems. So that has been probably the most extraordinary journey for me, is that I grew these plants to prove an intellectual point to myself and to grow food and vegetables for me and my family. And then I realised that I was doing something much more important for my local um, nature and, and, and habitat. Uh, one thing led to another, I started writing a blog, it led to a book uh, called The Edible Balcony and I um, filled it with how to start a, a garden in a small space and then these lovely recipes based on what I grow um, from, um, what I cook from what I grow on the balcony. Uh, and again, it was um, really unexpected, it became a bestseller. I now travel around the world, uh, believe it or not, so I'm um, a, f a famous small space gardener. I've just come back from Sweden where that was how I was introduced and it just made my mind boggle that that could actually be a job, but it, it actually is. Uh, and it's just so rewarding to know the um, effect that um, the book and this sort of theory has had on so many communities. The Wayside Chapel, which is just up the road from me, a homeless crisis centre, saw my work. They had just put a rooftop on their new building and asked me to start a rooftop vegetable garden, 200 square metres, so I was so excited. That was so much space in the inner city. So um, we started planting up that rooftop. You can all go along to see it. We take tours now. It's run by all our homeless um, visitors, and that garden now supplies veggies for all the two kitchens in the complex, uh, nutritious, tasty, and of course using the skill set of our homeless visitors um, that a lot of them actually have uh, horticultural skills, but because of their other challenges and mental health issues and alcoholism and things, um, that's fallen by the wayside, literally. So they love the watering of it. Um, this is Pee Wee hugging the curry bush. And again, you know, this biophilia that Andrew was talking about, when you touch plants and the energy from connection, because today is all about connection, I'm even amazed at it. Um, the joy I just get of touching and, and smelling of the fragrance of, of plants and a morning where I don't get to do that, I, I really notice it in my day. Uh, and again, everything that we grow on that roof is all organic um, and we are now supporting, with the wonderful help of Kylie Kwong, who will be speaking after me, who's a local ambassador for the Wayside as well. Uh, we have beehives now on the roof, um, supporting our local bee habitat, and the wonderful honey that we get from those beehives, Kylie uses in her pork buns at the Billy Kwong restaurant across the road. So again, it's this lovely cycle that these gardens are now supporting community in so many ways, uh, and delicious food. So if you haven't had Kylie's buns, you have to try these, they're amazing. Uh, this has now spread right across the country and the world. Um, I've um, put out a second book, The Edible City, and both these books are available at the bookstore, about some of these amazing communities around Australia that have taken on some of these principles about converting wasted space into places to green, to grow, to bring community together. And just really quickly, this is a beautiful restaurant in Melbourne that has put a rooftop vegetable garden on top of their restaurant, and it's now become the country's largest worm farm. So all the waste from the restaurant goes into these worm farms and um, again um, the worms and the beautiful fertilizer they produce the restaurateur actually instead of getting a doggy bag at the end of the night you get a bottle of worm we um, <laughs> with your bill and it's a great way then to um, show that connection to the wonderful garden above you and and how that's produced some of the food that you've eaten so that's a wonderful um, a restaurant in Melbourne that's taken on these principles. This is a stunning school garden in Redfern. 89% uh, of the kids are Indigenous, came from very poor backgrounds, very poor nutrition, and so two teachers started this lovely school garden where the kids grow their own Indigenous food, learn about their Indigenous culture, and how to cook. And now a lot of them cook for their own family and run uh, the, the supermarket runs as well because they know what nutrition is, they know how important it is to have things that isn't, aren't frozen or, or takeaway, which is the way a lot of them had been um, brought up. This had been an old tennis court that had been covered in weeded tarmac, transformed into this beautiful teaching growing space. Another garden we feature is the Taramara Garden, some of you may have seen on the North Shore. They dug up an old disused um, um, park that no one had used and built it into this beautiful community garden between the railway station and a nursing home. And a lot of the residents who are um, in nursing homes um, are lonely, they're isolated, they don't use their bodies enough and exercise. So this garden has become a really important community connected to other residents, uh, to growing their own food, to building their strength and nutrition. And it's wonderful on Saturdays to see how they all come together, share recipes, share what they grow 
and um, you know build a beautiful community. This last garden is one of my most heartwarming probably. It's run by a refugee community in Melbourne. Uh, these are old um, uh, social housing units. There was a lot of crime and violence and drug dealing that went on there. A lot of police were called almost every week for some um, violent incident. And these poor refugees were stuck here uh, without language skills, without any connection to their homeland. And so the council gave them a bit of the parkland to convert into vegetable um, beds to grow their own food that they couldn't even get in the local market. So they uh, you know, tentatively came out of their apartments, started sharing their skill sets, whether they're Vietnamese or from the Horn of Africa, and started growing the food, which started making them feel at home. And again, most of them had come from rural backgrounds in their old homes, so they knew how to grow. Uh, they just didn't have the space to do it. And it's transformed this community. It's been extraordinary to document over the last five years to see the crime levels drop, the community build, uh, the language skills improve and everyone coming together, sharing what they know and you know, truly using the food in the garden to build community. Because that's what I love about gardens. You don't have to have a mutual language when you have a garden. That becomes your, your common language. They built a pizza oven and they cook their own food once a month. And it is really, really heartwarming uh, to see that communities can be welcoming and they can support vulnerable people and refugees and um, the other side that we see on the news doesn't have to be the model that we replicate. A few more recipes from that book as well and this is um, just want to finish off on some of the really inspiring projects that are taking this concept to a bigger global level. These people in New York are converting rooftops into farms. So this is a Brooklyn Grange farm that's converted the rooftop of an um, a, uh, office block, uh, again supporting refugees who are coming into New York. Um, and again, you, any space can be utilised if you uh, understand the basic principles of growing food. And I document a lot of these in the book to give you inspiration about your urban wasted space and how it can be converted. And then this is a couple of programs that are going in London. And this is my um, inspiration when I look at Parliament House and every, every um, yeah, I know, every month there's another terrorist. Thank you another terrorist alert and they put up another fence and stop you from walking on, because it is a green roof. It should have been a beautiful place for the community to gather and, and feel part of, but we're being more and more restricted. So my, my dream for Canberra Parliament House is we um, build vegetables and put vegetable gardens where the, the grass is now. And I think that that would be terrific for our politicians. And as someone said in one of my recent presentations, well, there's enough manure under there to feed the veggies, so they would do really well. But uh, thank you very much. See you in a moment. Thank you.